Hey everyone, this is Dr. Drizzle and welcome to the National Park Adventure Crossing America. Today we're in Voyagers National Park on Cabotogama Lake in the Ellsworth Rock Garden. Thanks so much to the National Park Foundation for having us here and also to our two special guests. So tell us a little bit, Ranger Mark, about how you got to this park. Well, for me, it goes back to loving the outdoors as a kid. I remember doing some trail work out in Yosemite National Park and Olympic National Park during my high school years, working alongside the National Park Service. And then life happened. I went to college and got married and we had kids and all of that. And then later in life, I decided, you know what? I'm gonna go back to some of those outdoor routes that are really part of my DNA and decided to apply for park ranger positions with the National Park Service. And was fortunate enough with my background and love for the outdoors to be able to then subsequently work for national parks like Rocky Mountain National Park and Canyonlands and Arches and Mount Rainier National Park and Yellowstone National Park and more recently Sequoia and Kings Canyon National Parks here in California before coming here just earlier this year to where I consider this my home park. Voyagers National Park, the place that I love, the state that I grew up here in Minnesota, and one of the first wilderness canoe trips that I took as a young boy happened here in Voyagers National Park. So that's a quick summary of how I got here, but I, I really feel like I've, I've come home here to Voyagers National Park. Well, thank you for inviting us to your home today. And we also have another friend here. So Jesse, I'm not gonna call you a ranger, because you're gonna tell us why you are now doing something else, but thanks for having us. And tell us yeah, a little bit about how you me. got into the parks and now into your current position. Yeah, so I actually, I started off with the park service before. I now work for a nonprofit company. We help out with the park, but I started off as an intern initially. Um, I studied geology in school and I just love science communication. And I landed a job at Bryce Canyon National Park in Utah. And that's where I really got my foot in the door to this type of park ranger work. I returned later as a park ranger and worked there for four additional seasons. I've also worked at Acadia National Park as a park ranger and finally Voyagers National Park as a park ranger. Um, and what really specifically drew me into this place was that it became a dark sky park just recently. And I love teaching about the stars. Again, I love science communication and it was just a perfect fit in this environment. Well, we've got everything for you today because we have the rocks behind you. We have yep. a sky above, <laughs> but Ranger Mark, this is a special place. We've been out on the boat all morning. We've just sort of heard nothing but nature. Tell us about Voyagers National Park and, and why it's being protected today. Sure, Voyagers National Park was established in 1975 for basically uh, three core reasons why we want to preserve and protect this area. One is, is it like our namesake, the Voyagers, it uh, protects and preserves a little piece of our human history here. And that was the French Canadian voyageurs that paddled these waterways during the fur trade of the 1700s and the 1800s, the French Canadian voyageurs. And then there's the outstanding scenery like we've been enjoying today in these waters, these lakes, these islands. It's just, it's just an amazing place to look at. And then of course the geology is, is very unique in, in a lot of ways. We're here on the edge of what's known as the Canadian Shield at the beginnings of the Boreal Forest and all these things that extend their way uh, to the north of us. And right behind us here, we're actually looking at some of the, the granites and, and uh, quartz and different things that are part of the Ellsworth Rock Gardens that might be a good example of the geology of the area. Some of these rocks are 2.7 billion years old in estimation. So it's an incredible park with incredible resources that 
we're all about preserving and protecting, not only for this generation, but for the generations to come here at Voyagers National Park. Well, what animals will we find here? If kids were to visit here, what could they be out of the lookout for? Oh my gosh, there's so many wonderful animals. Some of our iconic megafauna mammals would certainly in include the world's largest ungulate, the moose. We've got a healthy moose population here, stabilizing, getting healthier, we hope, in the years to come. We've got a number of gray wolves, uh, a lot of different wolves, wolf packs uh, roaming these lands around uh, Voyagers National Park, um, known as the Eastern timber wolf for some, but a lot of gray wolves. And of course, the, the black bear is another megafauna mammal here in the park. I would say those are the big three, but I would re be remiss without mentioning the beaver. The beaver is a mammal that was pursued during the French Canadian Voyager fur trade. And it's a big reason why these waterways opened up um, for further exploration into the North American continent. So those would be some of the key animals here at Voyageurs. So I noticed coming over here on the boat that there were a lot of fishermen out here. So yes. what, what is the big catch? Walleye is king. That is the species of fish that most uh, people that love to fish are pursuing in these waters. We have many other species of fish as well, in addition to walleye, such as northern pike and uh, crappie and bluegill, but some less common fish as well, such as uh, muskie, a very large fish, and sturgeon, which, by the way, the indigenous people of this area, the Ojibwe, were known to spear in places like the base of Kettle Falls and other areas around these waters. So those are just a few species of fish that uh, people come from all over to, to pursue. Well, we're here in September and it's a little chilly out here. So do you guys close down when it snows? We do not. Voyagers National Park is open to the public year-round, all 12 months of the year. Now, some of our operations uh, become a little less as we get into the colder months. We don't keep all of our visitor centers open, but people come not only for uh, an array of summer activities, but also winter activities, other recreational pursuits, such as ice fishing, digging a three to four foot hole through the ice. It freezes that thick sometimes in the winter. Also snowmobiling is a big draw as well. So cross country skiing, snowshoeing, we've got a number of trails that we keep as well during the winter months. So it really is a year round uh, park for people to enjoy. Well, we also know that dark skies is something that Voyagers is known for and something that you were kind of drawn to here. So I'm assuming you can see the dark skies every month right? Oh yeah. So tell us about what we would find out here in the dark skies. Yeah, so on a really perfectly dark night you can see up to thousands of stars. You can see the beautiful band of the Milky Way shooting across the sky. Uh, we give programs here, both the Rangers and the nonprofit Voyagers Conservancy, uh, where we bring out telescopes and we can look at planets. Uh, Saturn and Jupiter were out this year. Mars was trailing behind as well. Um, you can see galaxies and nebulae. Uh, really anything you can think of, and it is really such a special moment. Uh, lastly, we do have uh, astronomy laser pointers that shoot up miles into the sky. We have to be very careful when we use them because they are very bright, and so we, we very carefully trace out constellations for people. Uh, it makes it a lot easier to, to point to stars, and so we're all following along with one another. So I have one of those too, and I have oh, sticky fantastic. notes around it to say, do not point at people. Yes. And I also yeah. keep it in like a Ziploc bag, and then I wrap it in I bubble it. wrap, and then I put it in the, uh, the box uh -huh. so I don't accidentally pull it up and blind my husband with it. <laughs> so I know good. you we have don't to be do extremely that. careful. Yes. So making this place a dark sky was probably important to the park. Um, yes. What, what, what do you love about this place being a dark sky park? You know, Voyagers is this amazing, beautiful, remote setting. People love to come from all over, including myself, just to sit under a clear starlit night and, as Jesse mentioned, look at, at the different constellations and the Milky Way and to see the night sky here in, in its pure form almost, uh, void of, of artificial light. There's a number of places people can go. They can come and camp in the front country and the back country alike and just sit under the stars and, and look up and see that, that never-ending universe that 
just really meets the, the heart, mind, and soul in terms of the experience that people want to gain when they come to a park such as Voyageurs. And the night sky is such an integral part of really having that full experience here in the wilds of Voyageurs National Park. Well, did Ranger Mark just come to you and say, we're going to turn this on dark, to a dark sky, and you just said, okay, it's a dark sky, or was there a process <laughs> I wish it could this? be that simple, but yeah, no, you, uh, you have to have a few different criteria to hit in order to become classified as a dark sky park. Um, one, you do have to be accessible throughout the night, whether there are rangers there or not. That is one of the criteria. Um, additionally, you have to be a dark place. Uh, that is a criteria as well. Um, and then lastly, you have to um, have a light management plan. That is a plan that you'll go forward with that says uh, uh, that you're going to quantitatively measure the darkness of the sky and that we will remain dark. Essentially, we have a small little device that points up into the sky and it gives you a measurement of darkness. And so we have to be able to prove that we're dark with this little device. Um, and so you have to submit that to the International Dark Sky Association um, and it's a whole process with them, and then you finally get the designation. Did you have to do anything different with any of the light sources you had around your visitor centers? We certainly did. That was part of the International Dark Sky Association's uh, requirements to not only achieve that initial certification, but for our ongoing uh, certification as well, year after year. And we've uh, retrofitted around our visitor centers and parking lots and things, uh, the lighting fixtures such where any light is, is cast downward. It's not spreading outward or upward and uh, causing light pollution as people would look up into the night sky. So light fixtures was a key part of, of what we needed to do to be able to achieve that certification and working with them um, so that any light is pointing downward. Well, how do we educate people when they come to the parks to enjoy it, but also make sure they're not using flashlights in people's faces? Is there any type of uh, communication out there that lets them know you're a dark sky? Certainly. If you go to our website at Voyagers National Park, in addition to our social media pages, uh, Instagram, Facebook, etc., uh, you'll find a lot of education happening in those forums. Uh, we have uh, ongoing posts that we'll make to bring attention to the, the night sky resource here at Voyagers, but also in person, live, so to speak. We have a lot of events throughout the, the summer in particular. We've got weekly dark sky programs, uh, different places throughout the park, programs that the National Park Service is doing, programs that the Voyagers Conservancy is, is doing, and then we have bigger events as well, such as our annual star party happens in the middle of August every year, where that's a big splash. We get the word out uh, to the public in a lot of ways and have just a lot of fun, family-friendly activities, not just after the sun goes down, but in the evenings leading up to uh, the, the, the night sky. It's, it's just a wonderful opportunity. So that's just a few things that we're doing to, to further educate the public about this amazing resource called the Night Sky at Voyageurs. Well, obviously it brought you here. You were very interested. So why are dark skies important? Well, for me, one of the things I love about the Night Sky is just the humbling aspect of it, um, putting some of my more trivial problems into perspective. That's, that's my personal love for it. But there's also other reasons that dark skies are important. Um, it's important for nocturnal animals and migrating birds. Uh, it's important for human health. Uh, it's also important for the economy. It's also a lot more efficient, um, a lot more financially responsible to use uh, responsible uh, light pollution free lighting. Well, I think that's going to lead us into a challenge that we can encourage our kids to tackle. So kids, you know we use the United Nations Sustainability Goals, or our Global Goals as we call them, to try to find ways to solve problems for the national parks. So we're going to use two of those. We're going to use goal number nine, which is industry, infrastructure, and innovation, and also goal number 11, which is sustainable cities and communities. So we know that Voyagers is designated as a dark sky. What can you do to help promote this idea of 
dark sky education within the park to kids your age. So we're gonna think about if you can come up with some great slogans, perhaps a graphic comic, um, a one page uh, flyer that you can create to encourage people that when they come to the park here, they can grab that, um, that flyer, they can scan a QR code, they can do something that says, hey, I'm from Albuquerque, New Mexico, and I'm supporting the dark skies at Voyagers National Park. And then give them ways that they can go back to their own homes and just check around their house and say, do I really need my outside lights on until 1 a.m. in the morning? Um, is there a way that I can talk to my community members to see if we can take down those lights in our, in our parks at night so that we are taking care of those nocturnal animals. So we want you to create this. It could be again, like a slogan, it could be a flyer, it could be a social media campaign to promote and elevate and celebrate the dark skies here at Voyagers National Park, but also take those same ideas into your community. Now you may live in an urban area where dark skies are gonna be almost impossible, but guess what? It only takes one person to begin a movement. So maybe you reach out to people and say, hey guys in the neighborhood, let's say at nine o'clock every night, we're turning off our front porch light just so we have a little bit less light pollution around us. We want you to tag us in social media at Dacia 92, but also tag Voyagers National Park. We want you to tag the Voyagers Conservancy, and we want you to tag the National Park Foundation and Crossing America. We can't wait to see what you create. Now, our goal is for you to come and visit Voyagers National Park, but until you get here, we want you to be good stewards of the national parks and create this. Now, we're gonna share it with Ranger Mark and we're gonna share it with Jesse, and they're gonna be so excited that you care about this national park. And I know you guys are ready to see what they create. There are kids sitting in the classroom right now, and we say this every time, but that just really want to work in a park. Maybe they grew up um, canoeing or being outside a lot, and they think, I could make a career of this. Or maybe sure. they've lived in an yeah. urban area their entire life, and they're thinking about they want to get more out into nature. We want to ask you to look in that middle camera and just give them a little bit of advice on how they can have your job someday. <laughs> Certainly. You know, to become a park ranger, the National Park Service looks for people from all walks of life. You could have a different upbringing, live in an urban setting, live in the country. You could go to school and study different subjects. A lot of people might study natural resources or environmental education. But for me, I went to college and got a degree in music and in business. And so from an academic standpoint, it can be anything. From a life experience standpoint, it can be anything. I worked in a lot of different fields, including business and including music. But you know, the, the outdoors is always something that I've always been passionate about. And it goes back to those early years of my youth. And I knew that I just wanted to, to bring that forward and pursue that passion further as I went on in life. And so decided to do that. And I simply applied to the National Park Service by going online to usajobs.gov where you'll find a lot of great information and a lot of specific job announcements being posted year after year. So I encourage you to look at that, but really it comes down to what are you passionate about? I just wanna encourage all of you as, you as you go through life and maybe you're in your school years or maybe you're an adult of any age, you can pursue those passions. You know, we're standing here today at the Ellsworth Rock Gardens and it's just one example of a man who had a passion to create things, to use those artistic expressions in his life. You might be studying science, technology, engineering, arts, math, that acronym that spells STEAM. Well, here's an example of somebody with an artistic ability that found his way into the national parks. It wasn't as a park ranger, but it's a good example of how people find their ways to, to work and live and play in the national parks across this country. And you can be part of that in a lot of different ways. So come and visit us, maybe volunteer, and someday maybe you'll get to wear this, this flat hat as a national park ranger. Certainly hope that might be the case. 
so Jesse, you also been in the national parks, but you're in your job now, you're still supporting national parks. Correct. So can you give some advice to our kids? Yeah, totally. I mean, I agree with everything that Mark said. Um, a big part is just following your passion. Uh, there's a lot of different outlets you can follow, uh, no matter what direction you want to go for the national parks, whether you love animals or plants or mushrooms or geology or night sky or uh, cultural history. Uh, just following that passion, I think, is probably the number one advice I would give. Uh, secondly, I would say internships and volunteering is very, very important. Uh, back when I was a park ranger, one of the most uh, common questions I would ever get is, how do you become a park ranger? And a very common answer is volunteering and uh, internships. It's what I've done. It's what a lot of my park ranger friends have done. It's a great way to get your foot in the door to introduce yourself to park duties and understanding what it really entails. Uh, and then it makes it much easier to apply on USA Jobs, which is the official website where you find park ranger postings. So again, following your passions, whatever that may be, and finding ways to get an early start with volunteering and internships. So we have a common theme here about following your passions. And you know that we say at Expeditions in Education, when your passion intersects your purpose, then you have found your career for life. And it looks like these guys have done that. We want to thank the National Park Foundation for allowing us to be here today, along with the Voyagers Conservancy and the Voyagers National Park. So on behalf of Ranger Mark and Star Dark Ranger guru of Yoda and all the things, <laughs> Jesse, we want to thank you for coming with us today and we hope to see you soon. So we're out of here. <laughs>